What's up everyone, JST Sense here, and I'm gonna talk about a subject uh, regarding Arrow Lake, actually, prior to the launch that I think is quite interesting. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of trust to rebuild when it comes to Intel. Obviously, there's a lot of wait and see mentality taking place when it comes to how are we gonna guarantee that Intel is actually uh, taking steps to make sure that 13th to 14th gen behavior uh, regarding degradation never happens again. So we're gonna talk about DLVR right after this. We interrupt this video to bring you a special message from iFixit. No, we interrupt this interruption with this interruption about new stuff from iFixit. We should even grab this card, but inventory sucks. Fix the inventory problems with iFixit. Whoa, don't drop it. Can't fix that with iFixit. Just kidding, yes you can. Wish you could take iFixit with you anywhere, but your pockets aren't big enough. Introducing the new Moray. And the new Minnow. Take them with you anywhere. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below for discounts and savings and explosions. More explosions. Even more explosions. Why are you still here? Click the description now. So on a high level, one of the reasons why 13th and 14th gen failures were so prevalent, really widespread, is because of the fact that board partners or board vendors like Gigabyte, Asus, MSI, Azeroc, they all basically got to like free reign, do whatever they want. Even though Fiverr existed, which is the fully integrated voltage regulator, uh, which was on chip, the motherboard could still command the CPU to do things outside of the CPU uh, requesting things. So there was a request and then there was a demand and the motherboard could override those requests from the CPU and push voltages and stuff to whatever power profiles and such that the board partners and the board vendors wanted to do. And this competition took place amongst the board vendors because if your board had like, secret sauce settings that would make your CPU faster in their board than say another brand, it became another level of competition taking place outside of just what the CPU performance itself could do. Unfortunately, Intel did not do a very good job at reining in and putting kind of uh, restrictions in place on how far these board partners could push the CPUs. Um, also too, because their case SKUs and they're fully unlocked, the board vendors could do whatever the heck they wanted. So high level, Board partners or board vendors started pushing voltages higher and higher to get more stability because they were putting no limits in place when it comes to how far voltages and stuff could go. So in order to try and push the clock speeds and get as much stability as possible, they just brute forced it with a ton of voltage. And what was actually killing the CPUs was not all core voltages or all core workloads. It was actually single core and two core workloads because in those conditions, those cores could go to the highest clocks that were set, which was six gigahertz and above sometimes, which meant big spikes of voltage to those particular cores. So it was actually those types of situations that were killing the CPUs when it came to voltages, not all core workloads. Because under all, all core workloads in VDroop, it was actually lower voltage and lower frequencies across the board. So now that you understand that, we're gonna talk about DLVR, which stands for Digital Linear Voltage Regulator. So it's the next evolution of Fiverr, if you will. DLVR has a, a few really interesting uh, design elements in there. And the cool thing about DLVR, at least where Intel is concerned, is the board vendors are no longer allowed, period, to ship a board with a BIOS that has anything other than the Intel performance mode defaults enabled. Now that's the way that the BIOS were supposed to be after the fixes for 13th, 13th and 14th gen. But I think as we covered and other people have covered, it took several BIOS iterations before the board vendors really got on board with truly following the Intel power profiles out of the box. So for instance, like our Asus board for a while there, sure, they, they, they put the Intel power profiles in there, but it was really kind of a convoluted two-step process to get them activated where they would still ship with their 4,096 watts and whatever ridiculous unlimited settings enabled. Now, if everyone out there who has 13th and 14th gen uh, and Z790, Z690 boards have updated their BIOS, they should now be Intel performance profile out of the box. Now that is what's going to follow into Arrow Lake. And in, I, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Intel and I got to ask these questions because I was like, you know, architecturally stuff aside, that's all cool. I'm really more interested in what the actual steps that were taken are to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So that's why the DLVR discussion really kind of took place. Uh, they are going to be overseeing every aspect of the board vendors. There is going to be a much more stringent, much more official kind of an audit process taking place to make sure that the board vendors are not creating problems for consumers by having the CPUs operate outside of their expected power profiles. Now the power profiles are the same three names, which is 
which we kind of talked about is, is kind of, we don't like it because of the fact that it creates confusion, but there's the Intel baseline profile, there's the Intel performance profile, and then there's the Intel extreme profile. Now the extreme profile is basically where the, the amperage, the watts, the volts, and all of that is set to the max rated limit for the CPU should basically never exceed those limits no matter what, unless you're doing like LN2 world record overclocking and such. And we'll talk about that in a second here. But just like fiber, you can actually dry, drill down into, through the, through the voltage power gates, you can actually drill down into individual voltage control per P-Core. So depending on how many P-Cores are on the chip that you get, there's three core ultra CPUs that are launching, right? The 285, 265, 245, uh, K, and then they are gonna have different P-Core, E-Core counts. So each P-Core can have its own voltage control and its own frequency control, which is kind of nice, like the VF curve on a per P-Core basis. That's just like how Fiverr was. Uh, and just like Fiverr, it's gonna have E-Core clusters that you can go in and do individual voltage control and frequency control as well. So, and those clusters are four E-Cores at a time. So each four E-Cores is a cluster. You can control voltage and stuff to them individually. Intel's also gonna be uh, giving much more defined limits for what those V-Core values are gonna be. So no more is there gonna be kind of guesswork based on those nuanced tables that are all kind of difficult to follow. They're trying to make this a lot more uh, easy to understand for the board vendors to know exactly where those hard limits are. Now, one of the things I asked is how, what kind of testing are they doing right now? Because the problem is this problem, it didn't pop up for a couple of years. And that's the thing, degradation, like CPUs are designed to run like 10 to 20 years, ridiculous. And there's always gonna be a slight amount of, of degradation that happens in that process. But that, that amount of degradation is built into the lifespan of the CPU. And usually under regular use case scenarios for like gamers and stuff that aren't overclocking anything would never, ever see their CPU degrade to the point to where it's no longer stable in its lifespan that you would have it be relevant and usable. And that's why you see people with 10, 15 year old systems that are still running. Every piece of silicon is degrading as you're using it. It's just at a very slow rate. And the problem with the issues that we talked about was it definitely accelerated the rate at which that degradation was happening. So I asked him, I said, how are you guys testing this to even try and head off any of these problems at the start? Because if it's a degradation problem, it might take it might take that year or two or three to find out what's happening. Well, one of the things that they're doing right now is they're actually doing some testing in some pretty harsh environments. They're actually using iCafes in mainland China where they are running these, these desktops, not like servers, but desktops in extremely hot, cluttered, clustered, humid environments. So not only are they testing it with hot environment, they're testing it in high humidity environments as well. And these apparently these systems are running 24 seven in these labs. So. I'm not sure how the humidity necessarily plays into the potential degradation, but that's the environment in which they're testing them in. And I guess that's important. You have to be able to support all regions of the world and high humid areas like the Pacific, South Pacific, East Asia, they're very, very humid climates. So obviously, or anyone that lives in just the Carolinas in August, you know, it gets pretty damn humid. So they're testing them in those environments. But going back to the power profiles, one of the things that Intel said will absolutely positively never be allowed out of the box for the board vendors is the extreme profile. Performance profile is the profile that needs to be set. So there even gives a little bit of headroom still between the performance profile and the extreme, which I mentioned are the hard limits of the CPU. Uh, but let's talk about overclocking because they're controlling the voltage again in the microcode, it, specifically on the microcode on the CPU, just like we talked about with 13th and 14th gen. But Apparently there is a, even if the, even if you went into the motherboard settings and tried to just like, let me add a whole volt to it. It won't do it because the P code will basically say, no, bro, that's, we're not going to do that. And this is part of what the DLVR is doing, or the, the digital linear voltage regulator is doing is the CPU is protecting itself from overzealous board vendors, which is a huge part of the issue that we've had leading up to this point. So I asked the question, I said, what does that mean about overclocking? Does that mean overclocking is dead? As somebody that likes to do mainstream overclocking and tune and tweak and stuff, I said, what does that mean? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can, that we can talk about this. First and foremost, let's talk about LN2 overclocking, like world records and all that stuff. Very niche crowd. It's like, we all like to watch it. It's like watching Formula One on TV, but none of us are ever gonna be Formula One drivers. So we still watch it because it's cool. So the same thing when it comes to that type of overclocking. There's something called DLVR bypass that is going to be built, that, that's available in the BIOS. Now they may be called something different per vendor. Not all vendors are calling it the same, but DLVR bypass is like, remove all safeguards. Let the motherboard 
tell the CPU what to do. But there's a caveat. What keeps the board vendors from just dis or enabling that on, on default? Like enabling on, which is disabling, right? So what keeps the board vendor from doing that? Well, I asked that question and basically it's gonna, f if DLVR bypass is enabled, a couple of things are gonna happen. And, and what's about to happen, as I'm mentioning here, is coming in a, unfortunately, a future microcode update. I really think this should be now. <laughs> I really think this is something that should happen now before launch. It's going to put the CPU in what's called a low frequency motor, like LFM, which basically says the CPU will not exceed 400 megahertz unless the temperature of the package is below 10C. So this is for like the LN2 overclockers and such. So it's, a, it's an extra safeguard that says you disabled uh, DLVR, great. Unless you got the cooling to support these types of limits you're now asking for, you're not gonna get the frequency unless it's under 10C. So you're gonna need exotic subambient cooling to be able to, to benefit from, from DLVR bypass. Now that's not to punish the end user. That's to punish the board vendors that might try and enable that by default. So that's specifically Intel battling their partners, if you will. You still do get some nominal overclocking ability uh, to you. I mean, with the extreme profile, you can, you can push the CPU to its voltage limits and depending on the ASIC quality, you might get extra clock speed. You might get some, some you might be able to even undervolt it in some way. You can't exceed the voltage of the maxes, but you can undervolt. So if you get a really good silicon lottery winner, you could push the frequencies a little bit and actually undervolt it. Um, if I, what I was kind of told, I can't wait to get my hands on, is apparently P-Core overclocking is like okay on these, but apparently E-Core has a ton of headroom, something like a gigahertz of additional clock speed available to the E-Core clusters, which apparently is giving huge uplifts in performance. How that's gonna to relate to games will depend on which games are actually leveraging E-Cores in some way versus P-Cores. Phil's mindset of this is, give me a CPU with no E-Cores. Just give me a P-Core heavy CPU and call it a day for like gamers that don't care about the efficiency cores or maybe that's not helping them. Phil's like, screw Cinebench, I want P-Cores, I want all the P-Cores. But anyway, yeah, so 400 megahertz is, is the frequency limit when DLVR is bypassed. Again, coming in a future microcode, which I highly recommend should be coming now. But I think they're, must be doing additional testing on that to make sure that it's functioning as intended rather than you know causing problems for people with it not functioning correctly. Now OEMs and ODMs like Alienware, Dell, HP Omen, Lenovo, right, uh, Acer, all these guys. So they've got in-house built systems that typically have their own custom BIOS loaded on these motherboards that may or may not be what looks like either proprietary or non-proprietary motherboards. They are actually being given some leeway on how far they want to push the the voltages now they can sort of de, kind of denote on their end ad, additional millivolts that are available to the cpu it could be 20 it could be 30 it could be 50 nothing major but i think the reason why intel is allowing that versus board vendors is when you buy a box cpu and you put it in a motherboard you get it say micro center best buy amazon whatever intel is on the hook for the warranty on that cpu and they're not responsible for what the motherboard's doing, or at least right now they're on the hook for it because of all the issues of 13th and 14th gen. But to make sure that the ecosystem is working as expected, then they're the ones that absorb, absorb the warranty when it comes to the, to the CPU. So you put together your own, C, your own system. Intel owns the warranty for the CPU. Gigabyte owns the warranty for the motherboard if you have them. Um, uh, Asus has the warranty for the graphics card. You have like eight different warranty companies because they're only warranting their part the ODM slash OEM is responsible for the whole system. So Intel is actually letting them have a little more leeway on their custom BIOS that they want to provide for their systems because Intel doesn't have to warranty the, Intel, the CPU directly. The warranty goes through the OEM ODM and those tray processors are actually skewed differently than a box processor. So whatever backend sort of arrangement happens with the warranties there, I think Intel is giving them a little bit more leeway on because like Omen versus Lenovo Legion versus Alienware, right? They, they're they all kind of battling too to see who, who could have the faster system when they're all using standardized parts, like the same CPUs and stuff. How do you make them faster? Well, maybe you have an out of the box overclock that's a little bit faster, maybe 50, 75 megahertz, something to kind of give you an edge over the competition. And because Intel's more involved with those ODMs than they are say the board vendors and all these one-off custom builds, uh, they're able to play a little bit. Now, not to say that that necessarily makes those CPUs in my, or those systems, in my opinion, worth it because they tend to come with a pretty hefty premium in price. There is a different kind of a 
relationship happening there than they are with say the board vendors. The last drawback I wanna talk about though with that is the fact that just like I was getting emails with the failed 13th or 14th gen CPUs, MSI and ASUS came out with the first microcode fixes before everyone else, and then more came, and then there was like three or four different BIOS with microcode fixes that took time. And I think the most recent one was even just a few weeks ago, like it was still going on and on and on. I was getting emails from people saying, I've got an Alienware or I've got an HP and I can't use the motherboard manufacturer BIOS because it's a custom BIOS that came from the, the ODM. So sometimes it takes them longer to get their BIOS updated when something important like this happens. So the drawback there is it could take longer to get those BIOS fixes uh, if something in the future needs to happen. But the last thing I wanna talk about here is the fact that Intel has a very uphill battle to earn back the trust. One of the things I, I said on the meeting was, it takes longer to earn back trust than to initially earn trust. So it's easy to initially trust someone until they're giving you reason not to, then it takes a lot longer to rebuild that. And Intel knows that. So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that they've got their ducks in a row, that they've done a lot of testing, a lot of lab, a lot of research to make sure that they've learned from the 13th and 14th gen fiasco, because clearly, this next family of CPUs and this whole next architecture and generation and what Arrow Lake brings in terms of like direct NVMe lanes to the CPU and the PCH improvements, the Thunderbolt 4 and 5, like there's so many amazing things happening on the platform as a whole, aside from just the Arrow Lake CPU, but like the whole Z890 platform is kind of insane on what it can do. Kind of, unfortunately, is happening at the worst time for Intel because the adoption rate is going to probably be pretty low at the start. But we'll have to see how the performance really stacks up. Anyway, there you go. I want to talk about DLVR. I wasn't seeing a lot of people talk about it, but it's the next generation of Fiverr and it's Intel's way of trying to take back a lot of the control that unfortunately they gave away too much of in the past. All right, guys, sound off down below. I'm curious, how many of you are truly going to try out Arrow Lake at the start? Or are you gonna really adopt that? I'm gonna wait and see what people are saying. And if they are, how long are you gonna wait before you feel comfortable trying the latest and greatest? All right, guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.